Today, we are going to be recognizing an underappreciated member of our team. She was the first female Jedi to really be seen on screen. Also, the first Togruta that we really saw and could understand their value of. And her fate is unknown to all. She has escaped death many times. Please welcome Ahsoka Tano. I'll wait. Of course, I'm actually talking about Shakti. Starting off with a little background information on the character, born on the planet Shili, we don't have much canon information on her time before the events of Attack of the Clones. Since this is the first time we physically see her on the Jedi Council, we can assume that she becomes a master shortly before this, since she wasn't one in Phantom Menace. However, in Legends, T pursued the path of Jedi Counselor, strengthening her connection to the Force and working under the Council of Reconciliation. Like many of the Order, T was permitted to travel back to her homeworld and connect with her roots. Undergoing a traditional Togruten rite of passage, T tracked and killed a wild Akul beast and crafted an elegant headdress from its teeth, which we always see her wear. T was highly independent and preferred to operate alone. To this end, Master T's training methods differed from the standard procedures of the Order, since she would take her students to her homeworld for training in seclusion, believing that it was best to be segmented away from the rest of the Jedi Council for optimum focus. Of course, she was one of the nine masters to lead the Striker Force at the Battle of Geonosis and was seen in action alongside other countless other Jedi, such as Ayla Secura, Coleman Trevor, Kit Fisto, and Luminara Unduli. However, like these other Jedi, it's not the live-action prequels where Shakti really stands out, at least not for the first time. She's mostly relegated to little more than a very interesting-looking background character during both Attack of the Clones and Revenge of the Sith. In fact, many more of her scenes were filmed but subsequently deleted, so we see even less of her than we should have. The first real display of her talent and specialties came to light in the 2003 Clone Wars animated series, where Shakti truly became the first female Jedi to take the forefront position in visual manner. Yes, yes, I know that by this point, the then-dubbed Extended Universe existed and of course had their fair share of Jedi such as Mara Jade or even Leia Organa, but many of you understand that it's different seeing this before your very eyes as opposed to reading it. And Shakti, not Ahsoka Tano, was the first real female Jedi to be a mainstay. That's not to throw shade to the other greats that made their first appearances in the Clone Wars, like Barriss or Luminara, but Shakti stands out at the front of battle and is even placed against the extremely formidable Grievous on multiple occasions. And it becomes apparent that Shakti is not presented like the typical Jedi we've gotten used to. She's not always calm and composed, at least not in her mannerisms in war. She's frazzled by it, and it's completely normal to see her as such. She struggles, and despite being Togruta, comes off incredibly human in her duels with Grievous. However, there is an obvious wit to her, as seen in these duels, that is very captivating. I mean, she literally ties Grievous' cape to a train and watches as he gets yanked away. Because of the need for more knights, it's Master Shakti that suggests that the Council foregoes their typical trials of knighthood and reconstitutes the method of a wartime promotion, a practice which has not been permitted since the new Sith Wars. And she's actually one of the few in the minority that states that Anakin Skywalker might not be ready for the position of knighthood, sensing some murky future with the boy. And she's not wrong. Um... She is actually one of the most exceptionally powerful Jedi on the Council, and underrated as such. I mean, she specializes in Form 2 and Form 4 lightsaber combat, the former, Makashi, being the same extremely difficult and rare form of Count Dooku, which requires an intricate and precise blade work of all forms since it's meant for only sophisticated dueling in mind. I mean, even Yoda would rise to say that Shakti was becoming almost nearly as competent at Makashi as Dooku, and seeing as he is easily regarded as the best Makashi fighter in the history of Star Wars, this is a very big statement to make. 
Infusing her weapon with the force, she would throw her enemies off their feet by plunging her sabers into the ground and sending force tremors through the soil, infusing them with the light side of the force. In the no longer canon game, The Force Unleashed, Shakti is revealed to be the only other saber wielder to best star killer, aka Galen Merrick, in duel aside from Darth Vader himself, who visibly struggled to do so, and he trained and essentially raised star killer. To further this point, from another perspective of Legends, the reason that Grievous uses electrifying cables to duel her when trying to kidnap the Chancellor on Coruscant, it's basically because he believed that should they go toe-to-toe in pure lightsaber combat, he feared what the consequences would be. One of her greatest gifts was her ability to commune with nature more deeply than most of the Jedi of that era, particularly accomplished in the art of controlling fauna and directing them at her will. As is Hugruta, her mantrails already give her advantage in this, seeing as they were able to heighten her perception and skills of observation with their inborn ability to sense movement. She could also alter the environment to cause thick fogs, blast away enemies with powerful whirlwinds, and freeze the surface of bodies of water. So, as if that wasn't enough, her telekinesis abilities were even praised, praised by Plo Koon, who is self-described as a servant of telekinesis through the Force. She is crazy powerful. As the war began to gain momentum, though, the Jedi High Council decided to dispatch one of their own, Master Shakti, to safeguard the clone production facilities and oversee the training of the clone cadets training there. One notable squad in particular, the eventually ill-fated and very beloved Domino Squad. Later in the war, Shakti presided over the arrival of clone trooper Tup on Kamino for a medical examination. So during the Battle of Rangovinda, Tup actually slips up into a trance and murders Master Tiplar in the heat of battle and tries to murder her sister too. Now they discover this is because of the inhibitor chips that are inside their brains and basically something is going wrong. At least that's what they think. The Jedi think that this is just, you know, something that is an isolated event, whereas it was basically Order 66 being preemptively started without the actual order being given. Fives would later investigate this as we know, and his curiosity would unfortunately lead to his demise. However, Shakti does give him the opportunity to explain himself to Palpatine, which the Kaminoans and Shakti often butted heads because Shakti was very empathetic and compassionate, as Jedi are supposed to be, and the Kaminoans really did purely see the clones as property. They did not see them as people, which Shakti definitely did. She respected them, and Fives would regard Shakti as a very understanding and caring person. So for her to kind of give him this opportunity, if it wasn't, if Palpatine wasn't who Palpatine was, obviously, Revenge of the Sith would go differently. But in this particular circumstance, you know, she's willing to hear him out, but Palpatine, of course, has like all his hands and everybody else's hands in the pot in terms of manipulating this so that Order 66 can still happen. So Shakti would ironically (laughs) rush off to defend the Chancellor, of course not knowing that he is a Sith Lord, from Grievous' attack on Coruscant. And this is currently only referenced in canon and showcased in Legends. In Legends, Shakti wards off Grievous through the bombarded streets of Coruscant and ultimately fails to protect him in the end, getting electrocuted. She's not killed, but she is left for dead. However, it's interesting to note that while we have not seen this in canon, it was referenced in Clone Wars Season 7 this year that Shakti had attempted to protect the Chancellor during this attack. Meaning this whole encounter very well could be main canon again, maybe except for some of these crazy-looking Jedi who we've never seen before. Um, But in Legends, beyond canon, Shakti's story does not end at Order 66, aka Operation Nightfall. Fleeing Coruscant, Shakti wandered the galaxy in search of survivors of Order 66, like many the story of Jedi survivors. Shakti had become one of the last known members of the Jedi High Council to survive the Order, except for Yoda and Obi-Wan. She ends up settling on Felucia alongside force sensitive, the Force-sensitive Zabrak Myris Brood, who she could sense was close to turning to the dark side and plans to train the girls to the path of the Jedi. I don't usually go off to this extent on things like this, but <laughs> how could you justify a Jedi who is, like, pretty shrouded in robes? Like, you know what? It's, it's fine. You know, you can kind of, you can kind of rationalize, you know, Slave Leia, like she's a slave. You can rationalize that, you know, Ahsoka's pretty young, she just sort of wanted to wear that, whatever, fine, we're not supposed to be sexualizing a little girl anyway. Um, 
But how can you just, like, look at Shakti and how she dresses in the prequels and be like, yeah, yeah, she's now a Playboy ad. Like, what? Like, how how can you look at this character model and be like, yeah, she can fight in that. This isn't, this isn't class A sexism at its finest. She not only trained her, but other Force-sensitive jungle falution that came across her, developing her own community of light side Force users. These would come in handy when Darth Vader dispatched Galen Merrick, a.k.a. Starkiller, to hunt out Shakti and quash out the light side of the Force on Felucia so that the Empire could officially take over that planet. Despite providing to be a worthy adversary for Merrick and ultimately besting him in the actual duel, Starkiller would land a mortal blow with Force Lightning on both Shakti and the Sarlacc Pit that aided her through her abilities of influencing nature. Before submitting herself to her fate, she would utter the prophecy that stated that Star Killer would be or has been betrayed by his dark side teacher, essentially acting as a fulcrum and changing his path in this fate of legends. But what kind of brings us to the big thing about Shakti, it's unfortunate, it's her deaths. They really could not decide what they wanted to do with her, even in the same movie so she's technically died a total of four times in terms of the big debate and it's funny because this character who really doesn't have that big of an imprint in like the films necessarily and honestly like the canon star wars she's really not in it that much but it's just funny to me that she has so many like alternate deaths like they wanted this to be a bigger deal than it ended up being unfortunately But the first of the many Shakti deaths was supposed to happen towards the beginning of Star Wars Episode Three: Revenge of the Sith, when General Grievous had captured Shakti and taken her aboard the Invisible Hand. Now, don't get me wrong, this kind of already goes against Clone Wars 2003, which was canon at the time, because she is left on Coruscant and she's found by the Jedi Council, so it doesn't really make sense that Grievous would have her when he kidnapped Palpatine. But anyway... I digress. George Lucas was adamant anyway about utilizing Shakti's death to represent the change in Anakin Skywalker and opted not to use this scene at all. Although it's filmed, it's included as a deleted scene. She actually apologizes. It's very sad before she's killed, but she's very peace. She's clearly at peace with it, as most Jedi are with their deaths. Um, But in another scene, so the scene that George wanted to be Shakti's death, She's seen meditating in the Jedi Temple when Anakin, now Darth Vader, walks in and stabs her in the back after she asks, what is it, Skywalker? This is the scene, like I said, that is confirmed as canon. It's confirmed as canon in the reference book in Star Wars Galactic Atlas. And it's also referenced in Star Wars The Clone Wars, where Yoda has this vision of that's alluding to the death of the Jedi. And in it, we see Shakti impaled in the back from a blue lightsaber, which is Anakin's. There is a widely agreed upon issue with this scene, of course, beyond the fact that it sort of doesn't pack the same punch since they deleted all of her previous scenes in the movies, like, sorry, George, but it truly brings to question her force sensitivity. I mean, she's a Jedi, like, on the High Council and is sitting in the very meditation chamber in said council, presumably not that far away from where, you know, Anakin just murdered a bunch of children. How did she not sense that through the force when, like, Jedi all across the galaxy were sensing that great, great despair. Like someone this attuned in the Force could not notice the brutal slaughtering of a bunch of children a few rooms over, and why the kids were left to their own devices. Like why she really wasn't at the forefront fighting off when, when this was happening. So it's very curious, and the way she's able to just say, "What is it, Skywalker?" and not notice the darkness in him. Very interesting. Um, it might be why they didn't include it at all. And she's also originally scripted to be beheaded, which they never filmed. And the only remnant of this version is actually seen in the Lego depiction of Order 66 in the video games. Because I think it might have gotten a little too dark. And I guess only Mace Windu is allowed to behead people. And last but not least, Legends shows her dying very differently in The Force Unleashed. Because she actually survives Order 66 in Legends... Um, Shakti attempts to use Felucia's plants to defeat Starkiller, but instead, Starkiller uses the Force to turn the plants against her. She willingly throws herself into the blue flames at at peace with knowing that she's about to become one with the Force with the rest of her Jedi brethren. 
In Clone Wars 2003, when she's temporarily rescued from Grievous on Coruscant, Palpatine delivers this line to Shakti. He says, your self-sacrifice will be long remembered in the archives of the Jedi Order. And it's kind of sad, because she really isn't. And if there's anything that all of this has taught, at least me, it's that she should be. I mean, she's crazy powerful, she's everything that a Jedi should be, and her history in terms of relation to the Clone Wars, as well as post-Clone Wars in Legends, and the effect that they clearly wanted her to have that didn't quite make the big screen just makes her a very special case and she will always hold the mantle as the first female jedi even if that is very much undercut there you have it guys some fun shakti facts there's she's just so it's so wild to me how everything pans out or doesn't pan out there's kind of a mystery alluding to her in terms of what we actually received um I would love a book on her or an or a comic book series. I think that it's well deserved, you know. Um, there's so many characters I think on the Jedi Council that we could deserve to know more about. She's one of the more sympathetic ones, as well as how heavily involved she is with the clones. I think that we just deserve to know more about her. You know, I'd like some Ayla Secura as well, Kit Fisto. There's all these really cool characters that we see glimpses of in the Clone Wars that we just don't get the single treatment that we get with all like of our Obi-Wans and our Yodas and our Mace Windus and stuff. So I would like to see more of Shakti. Would you? Not in the more that Force Unleashed was giving us, but you know. <laughs> May the Force be with you guys. Have a great day.